Have you ever read that 50% of all marriages end in divorce? Raise your hand if you have. All right, most of you. I read about it in our journal uh, this week. Uh, have you ever heard that the divorce rate is just as high for Christians as it is for non-Christians? Raise your hand if that's... When pastors share these kind of statistics, uh, we're trying to motivate people uh, to work hard on their marriages. But when we say these kinds of things, it has the opposite effect. People are demoralized. Uh, they think, what's the use? Why even bother getting married? It's just going to end in failure. And why go to church? It won't help your marriage. The other problem is that these statistics are not true. They're not even close to true. A researcher and writer, Shondi Felden, in her book, The Good News About Marriage, gives us new, accurate, and encouraging statistics about marriage. She began to question the statistic that 50% of all marriages end in divorce, which came out in 2006. Uh, and the 2009 George Barna study that suggested Christians get as many divorces as non-Christians, but it took her eight years to unravel the data. Here's what she found. 72%, why don't you read this with me? 72% of those who have ever been married are still married to their first spouse. And the 28% who aren't includes everyone who was married for many years until a spouse died. So adding in the rate of widowhood, uh, Feldon estimates the divorce rate for first marriages is probably no more than 21 to 25%. Adding in people that are married second time or third time, fourth time, fifth time, it's no higher than 31 to 35%. Uh, Felton wants us to understand when we hear someone say that half of marriages end in divorce, these studies are only projections. The actual numbers have never come close. As to the George Barna study that suggests that Christians do just as badly as non-Christians in marriage, he feels very badly that his study went viral. Uh, he, he actually found no such thing. Uh, he told Feldon that he wasn't distorting, uh, studying the divorce rate in the church. He was studying uh, divorce rates of people with Christian and non-Christian belief systems. And he didn't take worship into account. So Feldon partnered with Barna uh, and re-ran the numbers. And here's what they came up with. If the person was in church last week, their divorce rate dropped by 27%. Overall, regular church attendance lowers the divorce rate anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. So, a faith in Christ that is growing, as church attendance often suggests, greatly strengthens marriage. Now, my point is, if you're single and hoping to get married or married again someday, marriage is not some old-fashioned, washed-up tradition that is pointless— or if you're married and struggling in your marriage, don't give up, assuming that divorce is inevitable. Since marriage is a good thing, the question I want to ask today is, how can we do healthy dating? Now, let me just say a word about this series. Chris and I are doing a nine-week series on healthy relationships. Now, we picked the kind of the nine biggest we could think of, but I, I realize not everyone's going to be equally interesting to you. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Chris did parenting. And you say, well, you know, I don't have any kids, so, you know, maybe I should just stay home. Or today, dating. You're thinking, well, I hope I don't need to brush up my dating skills. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I think all of us need to know about relationships and what God teaches in his word about them. Uh, love God is our first priority, and then love people is our second. So even if this subject today doesn't maybe... This isn't on your top, you know, two or three list of important things. Uh, maybe you have kids or parents that are, uh, or, or neighbors uh, that this would be greatly important to know about, and you need to learn about this too. Before we had on day, uh, online dating services like Zeusk, Match, Our Time, Elite Singles, and Christian Mingle, uh, sometimes singles would post uh, advertisements in magazines. I found these ads in the Lonely Hearts column in the Chicago Tribune. 
airline pilot, loaded, wants to fly with professional single female nonstop to happiness. <laughs> Ugly, dull, unstable, incompetent, New York City woman, mid-40s, seeks dramatically opposite male. An elderly woman called her pastor to discuss her memorial service. She said, I want all women pallbearers. He looked at her kind of quizzically and she said, the men didn't take me out when I'm living, so they're not going to take me out when I'm dead. <laughs> no. <laughs> Megan Harrington has recently come out with a video series called The Dating Project. Nearly half of American adults are single, but Megan finds that many of them confess they don't know how to do the whole dating thing. They don't know how to find a date or, you know, what to do on a date. I'm aware that some of you are perfectly content to remain single, and that may be God's plan for you. But whether you're a teenager or in your 80s, in case the love train stops at your home and your life moves in a new direction... And since I've talked to a lot of singles and a lot of married people over the years who say, I made mistakes dating, I'd like to share with you my top six pieces of advice for singles looking for healthy dating. One, do due diligence on the person's character. Uh, Henry Cloud, psychologist, in his book, Never Go Back, shares this true story. So how, so how long have you lived here in Nashville, I asked our server at the restaurant. About a year, and I love it. But my daughter and I are about to move, she said. Oh, really? I asked, where are you moving if you love? Why are you moving if you love it? Because my boyfriend lives in Chicago, and I'm moving there to be with him, she said. A long-distance relationship is hard. That's true. Must be pretty serious, I asked. Yes, we're perfect together, she said. We are a great match. Cool. How long have you guys been together, I asked. Two months, she said. You've been dating for two months? How long have you known him? For two months, she said. I met him this summer. And you're going to move to be with him after only knowing him for two months? Really? I said, a bit startled. Yes, he's really great, she said emphatically. Wow, I said. Wow. Wow. I just didn't know what else to say. Why did you move here? I had come here to finish my degree in nursing, she said. But I didn't start the new semester because I would have had to pull out early to move to Chicago. So I decided to try to go to school somewhere there next January. So you could be with him, I asked. Yes, I didn't want to start school and then move later to be with him, she explained. I just nodded. She went away and my friend, Dr. John Townsend, and I just looked at each other, shaking our heads. When she came back, I couldn't refrain. I don't know you, I began, but I have to be honest with you. You changed your whole life to pursue your passion here. You love living here, and you had a plan. Then you meet someone and are instantly ready to give all that up, move to Chicago. Who'd want to move to Chicago? Not knowing what you will do there after knowing him for only two months. That seems really fast. Oh, I don't think so. We are perfect together. We are such a good match. I'm sure this time. This time, I said? She went on to tell me about her previous marriage and how that had ended, but now she was sure. Weren't you sure when you married the first one, I asked her? Yes, but he turned out not to be so good. I did the right thing to get out of that, she said. Maybe you would do well to have a little more time to be different sure this time before you uproot your entire life after two months of knowing someone, I said, totally surprising myself with how direct I was being with someone I'd only known for five minutes. What a pain of a customer I was. No, I'm sure. I can tell, she said. We've all had a few more times about the whole topic of taking time to know someone well before making big decisions, but it was clear. She was sure. She was on a mission to get to Chicago, and no mere restaurant customer was going to slow her down, even if I was a psychologist and written several books on the topic. Well, you might be the exception, I said. Some people meet and make a decision very quickly and have things turn out well. It does happen, but in my experience, that is the exception not the rule. Much more often when people fall in love and make a big decision before they actually know what they didn't know, they end up with a lot of regrets. My totally unsolicited advice? He might be the right for you, but if he is, he will still be just as right a year from now as he is now. So my suggestion is you take some time to get to know him better before you totally uproot your life. 
Then came the killer response. I know that makes the most sense, but if I wait, then I'll have already started school here and I don't want to change schools. I would rather move and start there, she said. And if he is not in the picture a year from now, is Chicago where you want to be living? No, I mean, I could live anywhere, but it is not my first choice. I would rather live here. That is why I moved here. But he can't move because of his work, and I can go to school there. Well, I said, I hope it works out, but if it doesn't, I hope you like Chicago, because it sounds like you're going to be digging in pretty deep there. And if you and he do not work out, that is where you're going to be. I know, she said, but it will work. We talked a bit more, and then she got busy with some other customers and was drawn away. As she did, John and I reflected. She did not have a clue about this guy. She couldn't have. She liked the package he was wrapped in, but her knowledge of what was inside was less than minimal. No one would even buy a carton of eggs without looking inside to see if they were okay. But she was willing to completely uproot her entire life and the life of her young daughter as well, based on eight weeks of long-distance dating. Amazing. Really amazing. Not to mention the fact that the downside of waiting, in essence having to change schools after a new semester begins, would be a whole lot easier than a failed marriage. Yet this mistake happens every day. Instead of taking the time to see if the eggs are intact inside the carton of a relationship, people like the way the outside looks, believe what they see, and jump right in, often to disastrous consequences. If you're going to buy a house, you get a house inspection. If you're going to buy a used car, you take it to a trusted mechanic who checks it out. Wise buyers want to know if there are some hidden repairs that need to be done. Now, that person whose hand you hold underneath the table, who looks so beautiful in candlelight, lived with an imperfect family, with rascal siblings, had some unfair teachers and harsh employers. That person didn't make it into your life without taking some hits along the way. The question is, do you know what kind of damage was done? Jesus teaches, by their fruit you will recognize them. Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Apostle Paul writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You can tell what people are like by the fruit in their lives. Don't underestimate the importance of this. Uh, you're initially attracted to a person's exterior, but over time you will experience their interior. Make sure you know their character. For example, if you're building a relationship with someone and everything's going great, but all of a sudden they lie to you, they fudge a little bit on the truth, it's going to sow seeds of distrust deep in your heart. My advice to you, as kindly as I can say this, if that happens, drop him. Get rid of her. Stop everything. One reason you look for a person with character is because that person is going to have an influence on your life. God's purpose for marriage is for a man and woman to come together so that they can each help each other become better people. Uh, Jory and I wrote this in our wedding vows, believing that together we can better become the people God wants us to be than apart. Uh, Jory's helped me become a better person, more involved dad, more caring pastor, um, better at honoring my parents. Let me read you another true story from uh, Henry Cloud, Never Go Back. A friend of mine told me that his daughter's boyfriend called and asked to take him to dinner. He went something like this. This can mean only one thing, he said. He's going to ask for her hand in marriage. What in the world do I say? How do you handle this? I know what I'm going to say when that happens to me, I said. What, he asked. I'm going to tell him to come back with his credit report and his last two years tax returns. <laughs> he laughed out loud. That's funny, he said. But really, what will you say? That really is what I will say. I'm not kidding, I reiterated. You've got to be crazy. I don't care how much money he makes. To ask would be offensive. I don't care about that either, I said. He can cross out the numbers if he wants, but what I really do care about are a couple other things. First, does he have his tax returns? 
And is he current in paying his taxes, which shows responsibility? Second, what does his credit report show about other commitments he has made? Has he fulfilled covenants to other people and paid them what he said he would pay them? If he wants me to believe that he's going to fulfill the covenant he is making to my daughter, I want to see how faithful he has been in fulfilling promises he has made to people who are much less valuable treasure than my daughter. Third, does he live within his means? Can he say no to his appetites when he can't afford them? <clears throat> Being a good husband means that he will sometimes have to sacrifice what he wants for a higher good. Can he do that? These are simple ways of getting a look-see into his life and character. I'm not kidding at all. Besides, I would not want her thinking things are fine <coughs> while she is signing up for a world of problems and debt she does not know about. Let's get it all out on the table. I not... I never thought about it like that, his friend said. I guess you really do have to look beneath the surface to find out what someone is really like. He got it. None of these issues would have been visible by simply observing the nice-looking, clean-shaven, well-mannered young man who shows up every now and then at family functions, takes a bit of an x-ray vision to see important qualities that are not visible to the naked eye. Now, in other places I have shared this story, I've gotten real pushback, such as lots of good people have bad credit because they went through a hard time or illness. That's not fair. I understand and agree, but my questions are still good ones. And if there's a good reason for the bad credit, like an illness or layoff or even a past drug addiction that he's recovered well from, then fine, I got an answer. Then she knows what she's getting into, full disclosure, and I know what I'm being asked to bless. I did not mean that the guy should be, uh, have absolutely no issues to deal with. These issues are not always deal breakers, but sometimes they are. I just want the truth. Then we can talk about what really is and possible wise solution. So I'm not saying you have to find Mr. or Miss Perfect. Nobody's perfect. But if you ser discover some serious character flaws, I'd slow it way down. Second, Look for someone healthy and balanced enough to do life without marriage. Some people are more in love with marriage than in a potential mate. They just want to get married. Who they marry is secondary. If you happen to be passing through the area and they decide it's time to wed, look out. Some people have the misguided notion that whatever problems they experience as a single person will be small, solved if they can just get married. I'll tell you, there's something a whole lot worse than not being married, and that's being married to the wrong person. Solomon says, better to live on a corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife or a husband. You, you marry too quickly and end up with the wrong partner, and it's like torture. If you have to date or marry to be complete, it's a sure sign that you're not ready to be married. Some singles look at their aloneness, unhappiness, troubles, and deficits and figure that all that's going to disappear if they can just get married. Not likely. If you're a chronically depressed, unhappy person, a walk down a wedding runner won't solve those problems. Ask yourself these questions. Why don't you read these with me? Are you healthy and balanced enough to do life without marriage? Here's another one. Are you becoming the person the person you are looking for is looking for? Three, look for someone who respects your boundaries. Boundaries are things like you want to take the relationship slowly. But a lack of respect in your dating partner pushes to take things fast against your wishes. Or you want time with your friends without your partner. They get jealous and don't want you spending any time with anybody without them. Or you want to spend time in your hobbies. They don't care about your interests. They want to change your hobbies. Or you want privacy. But they want to know all your passwords to your social media accounts or phone. When you encounter this kind of possessiveness and lack of respect for your boundaries, I'd take a step back. Four, look for someone who shares your values in raising children. Now, this may be the furthest thing from your mind. When I met Jory and uh, we got married, I wasn't wondering what kind of a mother she would be. 
Uh, but looking back and seeing how important children have been in our marriage, it's a consideration I think couples uh, should consider. I always ask couples I'm counseling prior to marriage what their plans are with children. Uh, Jory and I never talked about children when we were dating. I had no idea that her favorite book growing up was Cheaper by the Dozen, a book about a family with 12 kids. And that uh, one of her idols uh, was a family in Chicago that had 12 kids. They bought a bus. And uh, they told all their kids they could invite a friend to this summer camp they went to. And uh, Jory says it's one of her favorite vacations of all time. I had no idea what I was getting into. So guess what? We have a large family. In our day, when beliefs in moral absolutes has been abandoned, this is no time for one parent to be saying, sex is to be saved for marriage, and while the other is saying, whatever you decide is fine. This is a time for parents to be a united front. The best way you can achieve that is by marrying someone who shares your values, agrees with you that you submit to the teachings of Christ. I thank God every day for Jory. Not only is she a fantastic wife, she's an amazing mother. We could never have come anywhere near where we've come in raising our nine children without her. Five, look for someone who shares your commitment to Christ. This is the most important one, and I probably should have mentioned it first, but I didn't want to lose you right out of the gate. Let's look at three of the most disliked texts in all the Bible. Uh, why don't you read these with me? This first one is Joshua. He's led the people into the land of Canaan. They've uh, driven out most of the people, but there's still some there. Here's what he says. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you. Now, Moses says much the same thing. This is before the people go in to conquer the land. Read this with me. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods, and the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Then the Apostle Paul says much the same thing in the New Testament. Read this. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? These verses are unpopular with singles, because it greatly reduces the potential mate pool. Why does God give these instructions for believers only to marry fellow believers? Why does he give us instructions that seem so outdated, narrow, exclusionary? It's because God in his grace wants to spare you the pain of marrying someone who would turn your heart away from Christ. And share no interest in your love for Christ. Jory and I love praying together. We love talking about what God is teaching us from his word. We, we love sharing about difference that God is making in people's lives and our ministries. And what we see God doing in the lives of our children. To share about Jesus, the most important person in, in my life. And have my mate yawn and have no interest. That would be torture so God in his mercy mandated that you only marry someone who shares your love for Christ you should also seek to marry someone who is equally committed to Christ when I met Jory her husband had just died of cancer I loved her at first sight but I'd never dated a widow before so I was praying every minute God help me know what to do here she was in the same situation she was a widow. She didn't know if it was okay for her to be interested in somebody else. So she was praying minute by minute, God, show me. The two of us, depending on the Holy Spirit, praying about everything made us a perfect match. The questions to ask yourself are, read these with me. Are you letting the Holy Spirit make you into the person he wants you to be? Are you becoming the person the person you are looking for is looking for? 
Focus on who you are becoming rather than whom you are hunting. Meeting the right person without first becoming the right person is a recipe for an unhappily ever after ending. Keep focusing on where you are going in life and becoming the type of person Jesus wants you to be. You may not be a religious person. You may make no claim to faith in Christ. So I invite you to wrestle with the question, are you the person the person you are looking for is looking for? If not, we want to help you become that person. Finally, look for someone who is willing to delay sexual intimacy until marriage. God says marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Uh, wherever we read sexually immoral in the New Testament, it's the Greek word porneia. It refers to any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage. Here's another one. Apostle Paul. It's God's will that you should be holy, that you should avoid sexual immorality. Same word. And that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. God in his word reserves a sexual intimacy for marriage. If you're dating someone who understands the importance of this and respects your beliefs, you've met a good person. But if he or she is not willing to respect this God-given mandate, back off. You say, why, if a couple is planning on getting married, should they hold off on sexual intimacy? Well, you have to remember that every command God gives in the Bible is for our best good. When a couple becomes sexually involved too soon, it often short circuits growth in the relationship spiritually, emotionally, and intellectually. Areas that are far more important to the long-term health of the relationship. Uh, the message we are bombarded with from Hollywood is that uh, romantic attraction is the only thing that matters. Couples who begin their relationship sexually often find that when problems come, the relationship comes crashing down because it lacks the steel-like structures undergirding the romance. God's plan is to build the steel-like structures first. Talk to each other. See if you're on the same wavelength. Grow together spiritually. Become best friends. Then get married. And seal it with the joy of sexual intimacy. When Jory and I were dating, it would have been so easy to become involved physically. But the rewards of waiting have been so worth it. Some of you would love to find someone with whom you could spend your life. King David wrote, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Give your life to Christ if you haven't done so. Put Christ first. Become the person, the person you are looking for is looking for. And I believe you'll be in a better position to do healthy dating. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you care about us and you care about our relationships so you've given us lots of advice in your word I pray for anybody here who's looking to date dating hoping to be married someday you'd help them uh, in that whole process pray for all of us that you'd help us to know what you teach in your word and and know that it's for our best good. I'm going to give you a moment just to talk to God right now. We're just all heads bowed. Tell him what you heard today and what is important that you want to commit your life to in that. Thank you, Father, that you love us and you care very much about all of our relationships because you know how important they are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.